So a very warm welcome to everyone for this one of our last sessions with His Holiness S.B. Keshav Swami Maharaj during this trip of his. And he put me on the spot. <laughs> he wanted to have him give the class. But then he said, let's have something interactive, some way by which you know, we can draw out a lot of questions and answers. Uh, answers. Maharaj is very good with question answers, as you know. Yesterday also there was a series of beautiful questions ans answered by my, him. So Maharaj, uh, thank you for agreeing. This is his... Thank you for agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> this is his fifth program of the day. And he seems to be... And his battery seems to be 100%. 80. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, a short introduction, Maharaj, that he is one of the youngest to take to the renounced order as a sannyasi uh, in the recent years. And uh, the reason is because he is so loved and his writings have impacted many people all over the world. Just in few years, he became from no one in the Instagram the world uh, to you no know, lakhs of followers. And almost many devotees have groups here, Maharaj, exclusively dedicated to your shorts and videos, <laughs> where they post every day. Uh, and they derive much inspiration because there is so much authenticity in which in what he speaks. It's not wishy-washy, it is not too analytical, it is not too, you no know, out of the way. So therefore, you no, know, everyone loves him all over the world. Uh, and not but the least, even in Mumbai, we all love him. <laughs> we want to have him more and more. So he's just a taster. And if you all love to have him more and more, please do chant and welcome him by loudly chanting. Haribo! 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 And uh, Maharaj, this, you know, format in which, you know, you asked. I was a very tough questionnaire in my college days. I studied at IIT Bombay. And, you know, when I used to not understand something, I didn't let my professor go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and 50% of my studies used to happen in the classroom, where the professor had to clarify what he teaches. So excuse me if you are putting me in this spot, I may question you more than my qualification is. I have to also face my karma. <laughs> <laughs> so much the first question which you know is, uh, that when I ask uh, for devotees to have their questions you know, uh, sent to me, more than 25 questions came in, apart from the questions that I was preparing. And honestly, all these questions are very genuine, very relevant. But I thought I'll just you know, start with three or four uh, from my side. And then those of the audience who want to ask a question, uh, if you can send a note to me uh, with the question, I may select or you no. Know, that's the best way because we don't want, we have very limited time, so we want to use best time of it. So please do send a note to me. Uh, then we will uh, we'll call out to the devotee. The devotee can ask, but please do, uh, we want to filter the questions, so only very pertinent questions will be asked. Okay? So as the first question, which I also heard you are uh, very into it, very expert at it, is about Chat GPT. How many of you use Chat GPT here? How many of you use for your exams? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very humans love shortcuts. We all love to you not know, take the shortest route to success. 
And chat GPT in the recent time seems to be that way by which you can prepare an essay, you can prepare a poem, you can prepare a class on anything. And I remember some years back when uh, Vedabase had come, the mobile app and all that, one devotee had commented that through this, someone can post to be a scholar without being a scholar. Because you can just search about, say, bhakti or japa, and you get all the quotes from, and then when you give a class, you can see third canto says this, seventh canto says this, and seems to be, you know, a very... And chat GPT has taken that to maybe a hundred levels more, where you know nothing about the topic, but you can present the most erudite presentation of it. So, yes, we love shortcuts, but what's your view on you know, the inner development? How do we exactly use these technological tools that are coming up? Thank you so much, yes. Artificial intelligence, chat GPT, these things are providing us with so much information in the world today. But we realize that life is not just about information. Life is really about transformation. You can have all the information in the world, but if we haven't transformed our heart, if we haven't transformed our mind, if we haven't transformed our consciousness, then the, all of that information will not lead to better well-being and greater happiness. We tell people, don't just read to get through the book. Read so that the book gets through to you. <laughs> Nowadays, people want to get through a lot of information. But how much of that inspiration is touching their heart and transforming their life? Therefore, in Vedic study, the process is Shravanam, here. But then, Mananam, think about it. And then, Nididhyasanam, apply it. And then, Vandanam, pray that this may go deep within your heart. So the process really should be Shravanam, Mananam, Nididhyasanam. But nowadays the process is Shravanam, Katanam, Pestanam. <laughs> Katanam and Pestanam. This is the new sutra for the age. You got it, right? Shravanam, Katanam. So, social scientists some years ago, they were thinking that the people who have the highest IQ are the happiest people in the world. Later on, they realized that you can have a high IQ, but if you don't have EQ, if you don't have emotional quotient, if you don't know how to control your emotions, your anger, your envy, then there's no happiness. And then later on they realized on top of EQ, you need SQ, spiritual quotient. Because spirituality gives you meaning, it gives you direction, it gives you purpose, it gives you hope, it fills you with love. So artificial intelligence, chat GPT, these things may help us to increase our IQ artificially. But they will not help us in developing our EQ or SQ. And therefore, it's not enough. It won't be enough to really uh, help us find well-being in all levels of our life. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliantly put that, you know, it's not just taking the information, but also, you know, you need to process it and internalize it. That's where the role of spirituality and technology coupled with the traditional practices is worked. Thank you, Maharaj. Well, there's a uh, dilemma in devotees' lives, those who are practicing a path to, for inner growth, for spiritual development that they also have their family responsibilities, the needs that they need to cater. So there's always this dilemma. 
do I need to give time to the family or to give time to my own? Because we would love, people would love to come, do seva in the temple, hear and chant in the temple, but there is things to be done at the home, doing in their career. So sometimes devotees compromise their career, compromise their family, and at at times there is a kind of saying uh, in Sobo that sometimes ISKCON becomes family breakers. So how do we know? <laughs> so how do we know? Uh, refine, uh, not let that perception be there and balance these two aspects of our life. For most people to live in family life and to function within that situation is the most natural way mm. to practice spiritual life and to live life. Family life doesn't have to be second best. Family life doesn't have to be plan B. Family life doesn't have to just be something that we do because we can't renounce the world. No, no. Look at our Acharyas. So many of them were living in family life. The art is how to try to build a spiritual family life. The other day I was mentioning that the first thing is you have to be patient with your family. You have to give them time. You have to let them become more familiar with Krishna consciousness. In the beginning it can be very shocking for them. And then gradually to try to involve them, to try to connect them, to try to lovingly inspire them and show how when you become spiritual, then all other aspects of your life will flourish. But sometimes even when we try to do these things, somehow it doesn't work out. Some family members will always be negative, some family members will always be skeptical. Some family members will always tell you, don't go to the temple. Even in that situation, by serving your family selflessly, even if they don't take to the devotional path, we should be grateful that even the qualities of selflessness, the qualities of dutifulness, the qualities of being tolerant, that we have to exercise in our relationships with our family, even if they're not devotees, all of those qualities will ultimately help us in our spiritual life. So even when our family are not devotees, still being selfless and dutiful towards them will help in your Krishna consciousness. So in that way we can also see that, um, yes, there is a benefit. So everyone's life is different and everyone has unique situations. So if you are having some family problems, some family tensions, then speak to the devotees because they have seen many, many things before and they can give you very, very good insights. And usually from what I've seen with most families is there's a way to work it out. You don't have to do anything drastic. You don't have to do anything revolutionary, but simply a little bit of patience, love, concern, and sensitivity goes a long way. So, yes, uh, try to make it work. Thank you, thank you. Two points that you know, I take it from this is that even if family you no know, kind of doesn't fully support, but doing it actually gives you that, you know, strength, values to practice and being patient with the family and being kind to them ultimately draws results. That's very much true. Many of the brahmacharis' families are now, you know, very favorable practicing bhakti just because of this principle that, you know, was taught to us. Yeah. Thank people, you, Maharaj. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So you can give them so much philosophy but it won't touch their heart unless they know you care. So show them that you love them, you care for them, you're concerned for them, be kind. And that kindness goes a long way. Thank you. 
So anyone has any questions, please do uh, send it to me. Uh, else, no, I have a list of your 20 questions, 25 questions here. The whole thing can, you know, go on between us. Uh, and Gita is actually a conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, where Arjuna was really confused. And Maharaj, your books, uh, like Gita 3, Tattva, and, you know, some of the books that you have written are so you know, beautiful in the way they present as the very title, the subtitle of Gita 3 is Wisdom That Breathes. The way you have put it is too good. Uh, many people are asking, what's this 3? Gita 3. <laughs> Can you just about the book? Yeah, generally when we see in spiritual culture, we always do things three times, isn't it? When you do Pradakshina, when you do some kind of Parikrama, you do it three times. When you offer something to the deities, then generally three times. When we chant a mantra, then generally you're doing it three times. Um, so it seems that there is something special in the number three. There definitely is, but the number three is also special because usually it takes us three times to actually bring our mind to something. Isn't it? When you chant the first, first Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, your mind is at home. <laughs> the second one, your mind arrives at the temple. And by the third one, your mind is arriving to the Shastra in front of you so that you're ready to hear. So generally it takes three times to bring our mind to something. So what we do in Gita 3 is we go through the 18 chapters of the Gita three times. In the first section we call it think different. And what we show is how in every chapter of the Gita, Krishna tells us to think differently from what we've been taught in life since growing up. In the second section of the Gita 3, we talk about how to. So in every chapter of the Gita, we show you how Krishna is teaching us how to do something in the world. If you want to know how to be determined, study chapter 1. If you want to know how to find love, study chapter 9. If you want to know how to avoid burnout, study chapter 14. If you want to know how to find your purpose, study chapter number four. And in this way, the Gita is the ultimate how-to guide in life. And then the final uh, section of Gita three is entitled, Why Not? And what we look at is the 18 main excuses that people come up with why they can't practice spirituality. If there are excuses, I have no time, Krishna answers that in the first chapter. If there are excuses, I already know all of this. Maybe you met someone like that. I am knowing Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> then Krishna uh, answers that excuse in chapter number two. If your excuse is, I have too many responsibilities, then in chapter number three, Krishna answers that. If your excuse is, I don't want to sit around doing all this spiritual prayer, I want to do something practical to help the world, then Krishna answers that excuse in chapter number 16. So like this, Krishna removes every single excuse. Krishna is an expert objection handler. <laughs> And therefore, uh, through Gita 3, you learn to think different, you learn how to do every single life skill, and you also understand why not. Krishna consciousness, spiritual life is for here and now, and there can be no excuse whatsoever of why I can't pursue it. Beautiful, Maharaj. So now the 3 is resolved. I am I'm sure all of you would love to have this book, Think Different, How to Think Different and How to and Why Not. Amazing Maharaj, the way you put up the Bhagavad Gita wisdom in this way. 
as you're speaking about three Maharaj, there's something that has happened in India recently about three. That's the moon landing mission. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> it's on the third attempt to, went to go to the moon, the Chandrayaan 3, that India says, you know, that we landed on the moon. And you know, in devotee circle, there is all this debate happening about Prabhupada said this or that. Just what's your views on, you know, technological this, all this development and what scriptures say or what Prabhupada says. How do we devotees, you know, resolve when apparently there are some statements that don't go with what's happening with technology? Yes. <clears throat> Science and spirituality can go hand in hand. Some people think that there is a clash, there is a competition, there is a conflict between science and spirituality. No, they can go hand in hand. Science teaches you about matter. Spirituality teaches you what matters. <laughs> science improves things but spirituality improves people. Science can improve the how and the what, but spirituality helps us to understand the why. And therefore, we don't need to unnecessarily create a conflict between science and spirituality, but rather we need to combine them. One scientist, he said, all I'm doing by all of my scientific research is finding out how God did his work. That's very nice. Because he understands, yes, Ishvara Parama Krishna, Sachit Ananda Vigraha, Anadera Adir Govinda Sarvakarana Karanam. Yes, God is the cause of all causes. But maybe we can then see how he actually did it. So I think we have to find a ground where scientific research and all the insights and all the understandings that they're drawing about the universe can then be interpreted and absorbed in the world today with the lens of spirituality to actually make lives better. All of us are sitting here we have all these cameras, we have all these microphones, we have all these fans and AC units. And it's wonderful because it helps us to be here and absorb all of this spiritual knowledge. In this way, we see integration. One scientist, he says, science and spirituality are opposed in the sense that my thumb and my forefinger are opposed. That opposition allows me to grasp things. So we have to try to create a synthesis. We have to try to create a symbiosis. And yes, science is exploring. Science doesn't have all the answers, but maybe science has discovered some things. And how can we uh, utilize that to make our lives in the here and now better? Thank you, Maharaj. So both go hand in hand that, you know, one focuses on the why and the other is about how things can be made easier and uh, to try to understand how God created this world. I remember the more you understand, uh, that today morning you said that just by studying a flower, mm. one can become God conscious. So, thank you. But well, this aspect of research and trying to find out know what's there, what's the best that I can. Sometimes even as devotees, no, now because there is access to YouTube and you know, Google, we tend to uh, not follow the traditional system of just you know, going to one guru, learning from him, rather than we go on a hunt. Oh, whom do I want to hear today? Where is the class happening? And we may try to follow a person or a topic. We may try to just 
get, capture everything that's spoken on the topic by anyone and everyone. There's other gurus, other people who are also have millions of followers. Or sometimes with, even within ISKCON, like there's so many you know, YouTube videos that happen. And devotees tend to just go on, just you know, a kind of uh, infidel infidelity, I should not call it that way, but not re really spiritual, learning from a particular teacher. Spiritual shopping. Spiritual shopping. <laughs> so how do we ensure, you know, we kind of follow the tradition of learning from a particular teacher and uh, and modality and, and at the same time, you know, take help of this brilliant access to so many ways in which Krishna can be understood by different scholars, devotees. No one person has the monopoly on the truth. There are other religions, there are other faiths, there are other spiritual people. And are we now going to sit here and say, only we know the truth and nobody else? No, everyone has some grasp of reality and we can learn something from everyone. And when a devotee is mature enough to do that, then that's very nice that we can look at different things and be inspired by many, many different voices. However, we do need to find a commitment in our spiritual path. When Krishna wants to teach Arjun the process of knowledge, then what does he say? Tadvidi pranipatena. You have to approach a spiritual teacher. And the first thing you have to do, pranipat, you have to be humble. You have to open your heart. You have to admit, I don't know. And then what do you have to do? Pariprashna. You have to open up a relationship with them. You have to ask questions. You have to reveal your heart. You have to place inquiries and see how they respond to you. And then you have to do sevaya. You have to serve. You have to show some tangible expression of your gratitude and appreciation for what they've given to you. And when you do all three of these things, then the tattva darshi, then the one who has seen the truth, the one who has grasped these realities, they can instill that within your heart. So becoming self-realized is not just a matter of consuming information from all directions. It's almost like going around and putting food from every shop in Mumbai in your mouth. But then at one point, you have to close your mouth and you have to chew. <laughs> yes. So you can hear from everyone. That's nice. But then you have to find someone. And what they give you, you then have to chew on it. Isn't it? Shravanam? Katanam? <laughs> Shravanam, mananam, nididhyasanam. Bandhanam. So that means you have to have a relationship with someone. Otherwise, it can't just be, you know, Asto Tarasata YouTube 100 and <laughs> million and eight. <laughs> we like YouTube. It's good. We use it. But the transfer of the absolute truth requires a little bit more of a heartfelt connection. Beautiful, Maharaj. Thank you. That really puts uh, things in perspective that, you know, it's not just about hearing, but Pariprashna and Sevaya and... Now, Maharaj, we would like to open up for some of our devotees have sent questions. So, uh, there's a question from Vaibhav. Can Vaibhav lift, raise his hand? Okay. Do you want to ask the question or should I ask? Maharaj, Vaibhav asks, something that you are very good at, uh, among the many things, that's book distribution, Maharaj. It's a very challenge for many devotees here. And <coughs> you would like to know some of those you know, ways by which, you know, either a technique or a 
you know, inspiration that will help us to distribute more of Shri Prabhupada's books here in Mumbai. Book distribution is our family business. <laughs> I think when Srila Prabhupada met someone, they gave a big donation. And then Prabhupada gave three copies of Srimad Bhagavatam. And then he said, that will be $40. <laughs> the man was looking, said, but donation? Prabhupada said, that was donation. This is book distribution. <laughs> So Srila Prabhupada said, I was also distributing books. This was the heart and soul of my Guru Maharaj. Yes, so we have to try to spread this transcendental knowledge. Book distribution is not just some sales technique. Book distribution is actually the most confidential activity in creation. Because there are souls out there who for millions of lives have been wondering, Brahmande, Brahmite, Kona Bhagyavan Jeev. But they did not become fortunate so far. But the moment they're stopped by a book distributor, and in those few minutes when you have an interaction with them, know for sure that you are changing the course of the destiny of their lives. And in that way, you are able to be part of the most momentous moment in that soul's journey through this material world. Book distribution is something that I, in the beginning, found incredibly difficult. As a young person, and still am, shy, introvert. Sometimes people hear me speaking, they think I'm extrovert, I'm charismatic, I'm, actually I'm very shy, introvert, reserved. And then when I joined the ashram, they said, no, no, everyone goes out on book distribution. I said, everyone, but not me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, these people are busy, these people are moving, these people are like, don't want to be bothered, and I'm not ready to go in their tracks and just intercept them. I went out on the street. They said, no, no, just smile and shout out, and they'll stop. So I shouted out to someone and said, hey, I'm a traveling monk. He looked at me and he said, keep traveling. <laughs> so I went back to him. I said, this isn't working, you know, like I don't think I'm cut out for this, you know. <clears throat> The devotee said, the first rule in book distribution is learn to take a no in style. I said, take a no in style? What do you mean? He said, someone, anytime someone says no, you just smile, you wish them a good day, and you maintain your enthusiastic demeanor. And know that every time someone says a no, is one closer to a yes. So you have to be determined, you have to be disciplined. I say Sankirtan is the school of life. If you want to know how to develop discipline, if you want to know how to control your mind, if you want to develop compassion in your heart, if you want to know how to communicate to just about anyone in any situation, these are all the skills that you learn while you're on book distribution. So, there are, uh, on one hand, book distribution requires some charisma. Yes, you must be able to meet the people and connect with them. But deeper than that, book distribution simply requires compassion, a heart which sincerely desires to help others. There's only one service you can do in the material world that you can't do in the spiritual world. And that is preaching. So while we're here, 
This is the most confidential activity. Srila Prabhupada said, keep distributing books and one day you will distribute a book, you will turn around and Lord Chaitanya will be right there waiting to embrace you. I had the fortune in my life to go to the holy dhams. I had the fortune in my life to serve their lordships on the altar. I had the <clears throat> fortune in my life to be amongst great saintly people. And I had amazing experiences. But I have to humbly submit to you here today that my most memorable, mystical, magical, moving experiences in life have been on book distribution. Because there's a sense that when you're on book distribution, Srila Prabhupada is always close by. Srila Prabhupada is watching. Because in the final day, Srila Prabhupada said, when I hear the scores of how many books have gone out, then I get life again. I feel like a young boy. So let us all get behind the book distribution. Some will be the frontline book distributors. Others will support. Others will encourage. Others will um, offer words of gratitude. Everyone is a part of the Sankirtan movement. And so <clears throat> just find a way to be part of the book distribution movement. Whether you're the frontline book distributor or not, support it, encourage it and inspire it. And in that way, we all uh, continue this great legacy of our movement. Because we need to flood this world with spiritual literature. Um, I have a theory, actually. A conspiracy theory. <laughs> Do you know what my conspiracy theory is? <clears throat> in the future, Everything is going to go electronic, isn't it? All books will go electronic. Now, when everything goes electronic, there could be a conspiracy that some entity then controls what access people get to that electronic information. And therefore, in the future, as things become more and more digital, there can be more and more control and access to information. When that kind of thing goes on, physical books become extremely valuable. Because physical books go beyond that kind of censorship. And therefore in the future, the fact that there are hundreds and thousands and millions of Srila Prabhupada's physical books out there, means that a time may come when everyone wants to search for information that is not accessible to them electronically. And maybe, just maybe, at that time, the physical book will become an extremely valuable and sought after commodity. So there you go. That is my conspiracy theory. <laughs> Amazing, Maharaj. <laughs> Looks almost like a movie <laughs> in the making. Was that convincing? <laughs> Maharaj, book distribution is about bringing Krishna into others' lives. And Janmashtami is coming. And you know, we want Krishna to come into our lives. And we also want to you know, invite many devotees to come and take you know, benefit of this Janmashtami. So if you could give a short inspiration for Janmashtami direct into our video camera. <laughs> this for a video camera to the millions of people that watch. A short inspiration about you know, welcoming people for Janmashtami and what's the mood in which you know, we do fest this festival. Once in a very rare, rare moment Krishna himself descends to this world. 
Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Yada Yada Hi Dharmasya Glanir Bhavati Bharata Abhyutanam Dharmasya Tadatmanam Srijami Aham. So Krishna comes to this world to give the greatest gift. Krishna comes to establish Dharma, to establish the principles of how to be successful on every conceivable level in your life and how to find eternal happiness. And so on the day of Janmashtami, it is not just a commemoration of Krishna appearing many, many thousands of years ago, but Janmashtami is a day on which Krishna's presence can be felt in an even greater and even more palpable way. And therefore on these festival days, which are the mother of devotion, one can pray for a great spiritual blessing and one can generate an inspiration and spiritual strength in these festivals that takes their spiritual journey to another level. And therefore, Janmashtami is a very, very much anticipated festival because it is on this day that we remember Krishna is appearing. Krishna is making such a big effort to make himself available and invite us back to the spiritual world. Krishna is descending all the way from Goloka Vrindavan and coming down here to the material world to guide us back. And on this day we're remembering how Krishna made such a great effort and then we're asking ourselves, how can I reciprocate? How can I respond? How can I show my gratitude and appreciation for all the gifts that Krishna has given me. And so yes, Janmashtami is uh, perhaps the most important festival of the year and a festival which can take your spiritual life to another level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Uh, is Adarsh here? Adarsh, would like to ask the question? Mike can come. You can ask the question. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept me and Ram. Uh, Maharaj, uh, in the current youth, we see a meteorical rise in uh, mental health illness, like depression and such, etc. Uh, I'm myself like uh, going through some phase. So, like, can you please help me? Uh, how can I? improve my mental health and uh, help others also uh, because it's like a very difficult thing the most important uh, our software itself is like seemed damaged a lot uh, we can't do anything we can't read book we can't understand like how can i help myself and others in this thank you so much thank Anash. you so much and thank you for being brave enough to say what many people are going through but may not be able to express that. In the Bhagavad Gita, Srila Prabhupada says, Arjun cast aside his bow, depressed. According to Srila Prabhupada, even Arjun was undergoing some level of depression. And actually, most of us go through some level of this in our own life, isn't it? Some days we wake up, everything's okay, but still our mind feels unhappy. Our mind feels dissatisfied. Therefore, mental health and uh, struggle on the psychological level is something that practically everyone in this world is going through. <clears throat> But Krishna says to Arjun, or Arjun says to Krishna, Chanchalam Himana Krishna Pramati Balavadridam Dashaham Nigraham Manye Vayuri Vasudushkaram. He says, Krishna, the mind is unsteady, stubborn, strong, obstinate. Krishna, to control the mind, I think is more difficult than to control the wind. But Krishna says, Asam Sayam, Maha Boho, Almighty Amdarjun is possible. Today, 
I want you to think of your mind as an internet browser. I don't know what internet browser you use, Google, Chrome, Safari, Edge, Internet Explorer, which one? Safari. He's a Mac man. <laughs> Return of the Mac. Every internet browser has a history. Every internet browser has favorites. Every internet browser has a home page. Every internet browser has an autocomplete so that when you type www.r then radhagopinath.com comes up. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. And in this way, your mind is like an internet browser. It has a default home page, a way of thinking that we always go back to. Your mind is like having a history. All of the previous impressions, all of the previous experiences that you've gone through, your mind also has a favorites. Things that you desire, things that you seek, things that are aspirations within your heart and your mind also has an autocomplete because when you see certain things naturally the mind makes connections to other things based on what you've done before and so your mind is like a browser and if the browser is configured in the wrong way then the browser will lead you to all the wrong internet sites but can you reconfigure a browser? Yes. You can change the home page. You can delete the history. You can change the auto favorites. And you can remove the cookies. So, Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita that there is a process. Abhyasena tu konteya vairagena chagriyate. By practice and by detachment, you can remold the browser of your mind. And even when you remold the browser of your mind, watch out because pop ups can come anytime. <laughs> but it's okay. You just click the X, you ignore it, and you move on. So don't feel that the mind is insurmountable. That's what Arjun thought. Many people in this world have resigned themselves to who they are. I can't change. I am this way. I am a negative person. I can't overcome my psychological struggles. No, no, that's what Arjun thought. But Krishna gave him the most powerful tools in creation in order to create that change. And so we can also do that. But you have to be determined, you have to be disciplined, and you have to desire it. Then anything's possible. Okay. Thank you, uh, Adarsh Prabhu, and thank you, Maharaj. It, it's, it said that you no know, birds of the same feather fl flock together. That's why we are all so attached to browsers, because <laughs> <laughs> the mind is like a browser, and we like to be with that a long time and. Definitely, we need to reconfigure it and hopefully when we type in www .radha R, so it comes Radha Gopinath. Beautiful way you put it. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, those of you who are sending the questions, please do write your name uh, if you want the questions to be asked by you. And if not, then you know, then I will choose some of them and ask. Is uh, Pratik here? Pratik, if you want to ask the question. Yeah. One question. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. So, the question that I have... He came all the way from Surat Maharaj. Oh. Just to attend. 
I'd like to thank Pratik and his team. They were also helping with the editing of Tattva 2. Thank you so much. So my question is regarding doubts. Uh, on one side, we say that, as you were mentioning before, Pari Prashnina Sevaya, and also that Shila Prabhupada mentioned that doubts, is, doubts are a sign of intelligence. And also we have that Samsaya Ashma Vinashyati, that those who doubt, they don't, like their destination is uh, doomed. So there are many doubts that we have. And uh, because even when we introspect, there are a lot of questions that come. So how do we discriminate which doubts should, are helpful in our spiritual life and which doubts should be which doubts should be ignored and we have to move on uh, from them. Thank you. Thank you. There's three responses to doubt. Number one, discuss. Number two, downplay. And number three, delay. Okay, I explained what I mean. When you have a doubt, the first thing you can do is you can discuss that doubt. Through discussing it with devotees, what happens is through the sword of transcendental knowledge, that doubt can be removed. Tasmada jnana sambhutam, ritstam jnana sinatmana, chitvenam shamsayam yogam, atistote stabharata. Krishna says to Arjun, the doubts which have arisen within your heart should be uh, cut slayed with the weapon, the sword of knowledge. So the first thing is you can discuss those doubts. You have to find a Sangha, you have to find a Vaishnav, you have to find someone in who you can reveal your mind. Because yes, this is love, Guyam, Akyati, Prachyati, to reveal one's mind. But then, another response to certain doubts can be to downplay them. Certain doubts they don't need to affect your spiritual journey. Certain doubts, we take a doubt which is here, which is not so much related to my spirituality, but we allow that to block our spiritual journey when it doesn't really have so much to do with our Krishna consciousness. For example, you come, could come to uh, Radha Gopinath temple, and you may have a doubt about some aspect of how this temple is managed. I don't think you would have any doubt, but maybe. <laughs> but why does that have to affect your faith in the philosophy of Krishna consciousness? That doubt can be downplayed because it's not major enough. It's not significant enough that it needs to hold up your journey. But what happens is we take small doubts about insignificant things and then we inflate it and make it a roadblock in our bigger journey. Sometimes we read something in Shastra. Hanuman jumped from India to Lanka. And then someone may have a doubt, how a monkey can jump from one country to another. Once we were in Soho temple actually, and Jay Veta Maharaj was giving a class, and he said, Hanuman jumped from one country to another. So one man put his hand up and he said, what? How can a monkey jump from one country to another? So Jadvaita <clears throat> Swami looked at him and said, um, just because you cannot do it. <laughs> so he became a little offended. He said, no, well, well, how do you know? How do you know? Maybe I can do it. <laughs> so Jadvaita Swami said, well, if you can do it, then Hanuman can also do it. <laughs> <laughs> But sometimes we have all these doubts, but why does that detail have to consume your mind so much when there are so many other things in Shastra which make complete sense and which are in complete congruence with the world we see around us? 
So some doubts can just be downplayed. They're not so important. They are not defining. Don't make them bigger than they need to be. And the third thing when you experience doubt is just learn sometimes doubts have to be delayed. Some doubts can only be resolved in the course of time. So there are certain doubts and we say that doubt is there. I can't answer it right now. But at the same time, I can't ignore it. But let me just lock it up here in this cupboard and let me come back to it after some time and deal with it then. And what happens is after some time when you come and you open that cupboard, you'll find that that doubt has disappeared in the course of time. So some doubts can be discussed. Other doubts need to just be downplayed. And some doubts just need to be delayed. And in time, everything will be resolved. Okay? Thank you. Is your doubt resolved? <laughs> about doubt? So, Maharaj, about doubts. There is one doubt that's right from child to anyone that comes to the bhakti. As is that if God made everything, who made God? If Krishna is the source of everything, who made Krishna? And if we are coming from Krishna and we are eternal, how can we come from Krishna the same time we are eternal? So this doubt is, you no. Know, I don't know. Okay, to discuss, let's answer delay, that one play. first. Can we delay that one and move on? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's answer your second one first. We are eternal. Agree? Krishna is eternal. Agree? <clears throat> we came from Krishna. Agree? But how can one eternal thing come from another eternal thing? Well, now everyone goes quiet. <laughs> So let me ask you another question. Do sun rays come from the sun? Can you have a sun without sun rays? You can have a sun without sun rays? No. No. So therefore the sun rays come from the sun. <clears throat> But at the same time, you cannot separate the existence of the sun and the sun rays. As soon as there is one, there is the other. And in the same way, we come from mm -hmm. Krishna. And at the same time, Krishna is eternal and we are eternal. Yet, nityo nityanam chaitanas chaitananam. Krishna is a special eternal and we are subordinate eternal. So that's one way in which we can realize that both we and Krishna are eternal, but still our existence is based on Krishna. And then if we had a father and they had a father and they had a father or a mother and where, then we get back to, then we get back to God, but then who is God's father and mother? No, but the whole definition of God is that entity who requires no source. So that's the very definition of God. So we don't need to superimpose our um, ontological existence. I'm just using long words now to confuse everyone <laughs> and then move on to the next question. <clears throat> we don't need to utilize our ontological existential limitations that doesn't need to be projected onto God because God is of a different nature. God is Asamurdhva. He is uh, completely different from the uh, living entities of this world. And therefore, all of us require a source. But when you come to that personality who requires no source, Anadir, Adir, Govinda, then that Anadi, uh, is Krishna, is God, is the Supreme Person. So by definition, the Supreme Person requires no source. That is the very definition. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Now this is a question, a very emotional question to do with uh, 
regret. I'll just read out the question. Sometimes we misunderstand and undermine our parents and then they depart. And now it's a lifetime regret. How can I overcome this regret towards my father through the Gita wisdom and also help his soul attain to the lotus feet of Lord Krishna? Krishna explains that we're all on a journey. In this life, we come together like straws in the river and we spend some time together and then downstream, all the straws go in their own direction. And in that way, by the waves of time, all of us are separated from each other. So yes, when the, a loved one departs from this world, then naturally for many people there are regrets. I should have served them. I should have expressed my love. I should have been more kind. I should have been more present. And naturally there is deep regret within our heart. But according to Vedic teachings, we can continue to serve people beyond time and space. Because that personality was not just your father in this body, but that was a soul who was taking the role of your father. And that soul is continuing on its journey. And therefore, you can always dedicate spiritual activity, make prayers, uh, have offerings of love and gratitude towards that departed soul. And in that way, you continue to help them even beyond uh, this chapter. So, there's always a way to serve. There's always a way to contribute. Uh, even if someone is not present before your eyes. And that kind of contribution is actually the greatest contribution because then you are helping the soul on their journey. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. So, everyone is excited to have more questions? Everyone? <laughs> okay. Maharaj, yourself? Can you take some more questions? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, definitely, definitely. I think we're going till 9 o'clock, is it? Uh, the temple management is allowed a little more till 9.15 if there is interest. Sure, sure. Happy, happy. So if, you, if you're charged, devotees yeah, are surcharged. No problem. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm here to see. So please do send in your questions with your name if you want to be asked. Otherwise, you know, there are a lot of questions here that devotees are sending me. Some uh, people want to ask live, is it? Yes, someone wants to ask live. Uh, and you can raise your hand. Okay, uh, back there, Adi Bhagavan. He's a heart specialist, Maharaj. He's a, he checks all devotees' hearts. <laughs> Wonderful, treats them. Wonderful. He's a heart specialist. And I personally wanted to give you a big, big thank you for that amazing acronym book. And, uh, I just wanted to ask you, Maharaj, that in that same book, uh, in the second chapter, when we say Gita, it's Guru, identity, uh, two dharmas, and then there is Atmaram verse. So, where is the Atmaram verse? Because usually it's in Bhagavatam, the Atmaram verse is there. So, how that has been put in the second chapter of the acronym book? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> Glad someone's reading it. <laughs> <laughs> Atmaramascha munayo nirgrantha apyurukrame kurvantyahai tukim bhaktim ittam bhuto gunohari. Bhagavatam says that the Atmaramas, they are fully satisfied, but they still enjoy to hear about Krishna. Even though they have no material desires, these spiritual desires to hear about Krishna are there. So, yes, you're right. The Atmaram verse is actually contained within the Bhagavatam. However, the term Atmaram is a universal term. 
Atma means the self and Ram means pleasure. Uh, Ramante yogino nantye satyanande chidatmani. And so Atma Ram literally means one who is finding pleasure within, one whose joy is within, one who has found connection with the Supreme within their own consciousness. And therefore, this last section of the Bhagavad Gita, the chapter number two from text number 56 onwards, we've entitled it Atma Ram because in this section, Arjun is asking Krishna, what are all the characteristics of one who is self-realized? What are the characteristics of one who is experiencing spiritual happiness within them? And therefore, we've used the word Atma Ram. The other, way, the other reason we use the word Atma Ram is because I couldn't find any other word beginning with A. <laughs> <laughs> But it's okay, because Atma Ram works. Actually, these verses are very, very interesting. It is said that these verses of the end of the second... Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, these verses at the end of the second chapter, they uh, were daily recited by Gandhi. These are known as the Stita Pragya verses the characteristics of a self-realized soul. So it said that Gandhi, of course, we quote Gandhi on the back of the Gita. He says, whenever doubts haunt me, whenever disappointments stare me in the face and I see not one ray of hope on the horizon, then I immediately turn to the Bhagavad Gita. I open up to a verse and in the midst of overwhelming sorrow, I find joy and hope. And so Gandhi was reading Bhagavad Gita but it said that every single day he would recite these verses in this Atma Ram section of the second chapter. So yes, Atma Ram means the self-realized soul. Is that okay? Thank you, Prabhu. All right, there's a question from the webcam. From the webcam, okay. That's going YouTube live. Okay. So they put, they've sent it to me. What is the difference between self-help and uh, spiritual development? Because there's a lot of books that are coming out, even the kind of talks that we sometimes so There's confusion, Maharaj, self-help and spiritual development. I think people probably define it in different ways. But I think what we share with people is that if you try to do self-development without spiritual development, then it doesn't really transform us on a deep level. Self-development will teach you that you have to overcome anger. Self-development will teach you the five things you have to do to have an amazing relationship of love. Self-development will tell you the three things you should do every morning to avoid burnout. But Spiritual development will transform your consciousness in a deeper way. And only when your consciousness is transformed in a deeper way, can you actually develop yourself in the most sustainable and uh, uh, profound way. And so what we tell people is that self-development without spiritual development will ultimately stagnate. Because self-development may tell you what you should do, but spiritual development will transform your consciousness so you become empowered to actually do those things. Yes, yes, Ma. It gives us strength to apply what... Yeah. Because... Jai, 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 Jai. Thank you, Maharaj. Yes. Uh, the DT is open to give us the strength and uh, we'll continue with the questions if you are okay. Yes, sure. Uh, there's a question by Ramdas. Uh, the mic can be passed down here. I thought he was going to ask the question whilst playing the Mridanga. 
He's uh, staying with us. He's from Dubai. He's from come, Dubai, at, yeah. come for a sabbatical for a few months. Uh, oh. Four of them. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Krishna Maharaj. Thank you. Um, please accept my humble obeisances. Uh, Maharaj, yesterday in Prerna Festival, you were talking about um, how we need association, how we need guidance from people, devotees, who can help us push towards Krishna. But Maharaj, there are certain times that we feel that this personality, this devotee, this person who we can call a Shiksha Guru or person who can depend on, um, at certain times, certain changes happen. People change. So they, rather than pushing us towards Krishna, they start pushing us away from Krishna. We start feeling that being with him makes my consciousness towards Krishna less now, makes me feel like I should be going or maybe avoiding that personality. It affects the uh, thinking as currently I'm facing this in a certain situation. So how do I deal with that personality? How do I deal with that devotee? I don't want to offend him. Um, but they have helped me before, but now something which is causing me problems. Thank you. We are all humans. We have good days. We have bad days. We have good weeks. We have bad weeks. Sometimes those who are guiding you, they are also human. They're also going through their challenges. In this movement, even those who are acting as doctors, they themselves are patients as well. <laughs> Isn't it? ISKCON is a hospital and all of us are patients. And therefore, even those who we are taking guidance from, they may have moments of weakness. They may have moments when they show their human frailties. So we don't immediately need to write people off. Oh my God, my Shiksha Guru missed Mangalarti. <laughs> Clearly, they are no longer qualified. Or I, I'm not making your, I'm not trivializing your question. I understand sometimes they may act towards us in seemingly unkind ways or insensitive ways, sometimes hurtful ways. But in any relationship in this world, try not to write it off at the first sign of difficulty. Because if you do that, I tell you, you won't end up with any friendships at all. Because every relationship goes through ups and downs. Ask anyone who's married here. <laughs> I'm not, you know, it's, <laughs> I'm not trying to discourage you from anything. I'm just saying, this is life. This is life. Isn't it? So be patient with people. Be kind, be compassionate. When they do something insensitive or unkind, also, remember all the beautiful things that they did for you, the kindness that they showed to you. But then, of course, if you find that someone is continually uh, bringing you down, then we say this kind of relationship can become a little bit, maybe to use a strong word, toxic. And therefore, maybe it's good to keep some distance. Then you have to find others who can guide you, others who can help you. But don't write that person off. Don't forget them. Don't shut the door. Remember that they helped you and always be kind to them. But if they're continually uh, bringing you down, then keep a distance and look for other Vaishnavas. Is that okay? okay. Thank you. Ramdas Prabhu and uh, thank you Maharaj. Uh, beautifully answered because it ha it does happen that you know they may not inspire you the same way and how do we deal with those people that everyone is a human being and we're all on a journey uh, is Jagruti here? Jagruti here? yeah she came from Puna Maharaj and uh, she wanted to gift you something from there do you have a question also? You have a question? Yeah. Please do give the mic. Hare Krishna Maharaj Nandat Pranam. Uh, actually, I was waiting for your arrival since months in Pune or Mumbai. So I came from Pune. 
and my question is regarding chanting prabhu ji i have heard a lot that uh, it is good to chant in the early morning i struggle so much so i just want uh, some instructions from you so that i can follow and chant attentively and in the morning yes the dreaded sound of the alarm clock <laughs> in the brahmachari ashram you have no choice <laughs> the person who sets their alarm clock the loudest the earliest is the one who also sleeps the deepest <laughs> isn't it am i right <laughs> there are episodes the in there the are episodes here where <laughs> dalaram was thrown out of the window yeah 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 and yeah, still yeah. they were ringing <laughs> I remember sleeping in this temple hall actually and uh, yeah it was intense you know like from 3 o'clock all the alarm clocks are going off one devotee once said to me you want to know the distance between the material world and the spiritual world the distance between this world and the spiritual world is equal to the distance between your sleeping bag and the bathroom when the alarm goes off <laughs> if you can make that journey you can make that journey <laughs> <laughs> so yes it's a struggle it's difficult anything in life requires sacrifice but let me ask you tomorrow if you landed a really really good job that meant that you had to leave home at 7 a.m. to get the train to be at work on time would you get up there you go there you go so that means you have it in you you have the strength you have the determination you have the focus but now you got to use it for krishna you got to remember that the biggest job the biggest career opportunity the biggest uh aspiration in your life is to find spiritual happiness and if we can't generate the determination to say krishna i'm going to give you the best time of my day i'm going to give you the best part of my attention i'm going to connect with you before i do anything in this day if we can't generate that it's going to be difficult You know one time we went to Varshana have you been to Varshana it's a beautiful place isn't it so we went met one mata ji she was like 90 years old and she told us since i was 11 my parents taught me to do one thing and i've done it all my life up till this day so we said what was that She said my parents told me when you wake up in the morning then immediately close your eyes and then with your eyes closed using your hands come off your bed and find your way to the wall and then with your eyes closed using your hands find your way to the door and then through the door make your way down the staircase holding the stair rail and then with your hands open the front room and then go into that front room and find the curtains and then open those curtains and then open your eyes and see krishna first so that was very beautiful <laughs> the first appointment of the day is the appointment with krishna if you want to achieve what other people don't achieve you have to be ready to do what other people wouldn't do ya nisha sarva bhutanam krishna says what is night for the conditioned soul is the time of awakening for the introspective sage they ask prabhupad what does this verse mean prabhupad says they think you're mad and you think they're mad 
<laughs> because the materialistic person thinking is this person is mad. You wake up at five o'clock in the morning and you're thinking they're mad, they're wasting. Jiva Jago, Jiva Jago, wake up, wake up. When I joined the ashram, what happened one morning is my phone went off at four o'clock in the morning and it wasn't my alarm, it was my phone. And I looked on the phone and it was, uh, it was one of my friends who had got a job in the corporate world. So I picked up the phone and I said, it's four o'clock in the morning. Why are you awake? So he said, it's four o'clock in the morning. Why are you awake? <laughs> So I asked him, you tell me first. He said, I've been at my desk in the city of London working for an investment bank and I've been doing an all-nighter because we have a deadline for the project. And I've been sitting at my desk all night and now I'm just about to go home. And in that moment, I thought, would I rather be going home at four o'clock in the morning after having spent a whole night in the office? Or would I rather be getting up at four o'clock in the morning going to see Krishna in Mangalarti? Rivo! And then I thought, and then I thought, maybe, maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> so it's very nice. Develop a uh, love for the morning. We tell people, join the 5 a.m. club. Because if you join the 5 a.m. club, when you hit the 9 a.m. reality, you'll be flying. But if you miss the 5 a.m. club, and then you hit the 9 a.m. reality, then 12 p.m. will be a catastrophe. <laughs> because you won't be able to navigate this world. Therefore, remember, the first duty of the day is the duty to understand who am I, why am I here, and what is this journey of life meant for. So we have to do that. And then everything will become okay. Shishi Radha Gopinata Ki Jajun. We'll see them at five o'clock. Five AM club. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Beautiful answer uh, to that question about importance of morning and chanting. Uh, there's a course uh, about you know, the Bhagavad Gita that we do every uh, two few months. So the next dates are uh, September 15, 16, and 17 after Janmashtami, Sutras for Self Discovery, the introductory course to the Bhagavad Gita. So devotees who have not attended or would like to bring their friends, please do you know, uh, call out and uh, bring this. Uh, please do register for this course. And thank you, Jagruti. For bringing the gifts from uh, Radha Vrindavan Chandra. Oh, Hare Krishna, nice to see you. <laughs> These are London connections. <laughs> so the topics are happiness and purpose, good and God, and Gita and life. So please do you know, register online. Uh, there is a sign and also our devotees are standing behind uh, for registering for this course. And we continue our, for a few more minutes, Maharaj. Sure. Five, ten minutes more. Uh, is Meghna Mataji here? Would you like to ask the question yourself? Should I ask? Okay. Maharaj, we recently saw you know, the painful departure of you know, His Holiness Kadambakan and Swami Maharaj. And we all love him a lot. He's an inspiration. He gave amazing classes here. And you being so close to Maharaj, you are one of his, no, 
very few disciples you know that he had so we'd love to know some reflection or a past time one or two about maharaj that you know that's very close to you that can inspire us we are made of the mercy of vaishnavas what can we say shila prabhupad when he was asked about his spiritual master shila prabhupad said what can i say he was a vaikuntha man referring to bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur so yes my Uh, revered spiritual master his holiness kadamakanan maharaj was uh, a great source of inspiration once uh, he said you know the reason you took initiation from me i said no maharaj please tell me <laughs> <laughs> he said because you are very introvert you are very shy you always want to stay in the back and i am bold i am confident and i push people forward and he said therefore uh my duty in life is to push you my duty in life is to um give you confidence in yourself so my spiritual master had more faith in me than i had in myself If you have someone in your life who has more faith in you than you have in yourself there's a wonderful gift because they can reveal to you a potential the spiritual master is that person who can come up with a vision for your life that's much greater than what you could have come up with yourself and so when my spiritual master was leaving the world he was drawing up his will and he was giving different things to different people and then he looked at me and he said i'm not leaving you anything i'm only leaving you service vivo and and what can be a greater gift than that the opportunity to serve the world so unqualified as i am My spiritual master opened up many many new doors and worlds of opportunity for me. That was his magnanimity, that was his kindness. He wanted his disciples to be even more than himself. How can we ever be more than our guru? But the guru has that vision of empowerment, of complete magnanimity. So yes, uh, I was fortunate. I had that mercy. Uh he lovingly pushed me to accept the renounced order of life and here i am as a small person in front of all of you trying to carry his order trying to be exemplary in shila prabhupad's movement and not uh, discredit this movement in any way so i'm trying uh it's very wonderful to be amongst all of you and uh Kadamba Kanana Maharaj always loved to come to Chaupati. Yes, yes. He loved to come here to speak to all the devotees, to chant, um, to break a few harmoniums. <laughs> When he would sing, he would break harmoniums. So yes, uh, what can I say? So many pastimes are there. Uh, but the essence of it is that my spiritual master gave my some meaning to my life and uh that was the greatest gift <laughs> thank you thank you maharaj we look we look forward to your narrating or coming out with a book of those past times in future and would uh, not love to conclude but we have to conclude because it's getting late for devotees and also maharaj had a long day but he still extended he is extending himself to sign these books downstairs uh, for those of you who love to take a copy 
of one or two. Uh, so downstairs there's a stall that is put up and Maharaj will be you know, available there for devotees to sign these amazing books of wisdom that he has uh, written. And Maharaj, although you are leaving us, you have made such a space in our hearts. Please come every month. <laughs> Let us thank His Holiness Swayam Bhagwan Keshav Swami Maharaj and invite Him again and again to the simple temple Shri Shri Radha Gopinath Mandir by loudly chanting Hribo! 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 Also thank the team behind organizing this trip, especially Mukund Hari Prabhu. He was the brainchild for bringing Maharaj here. Hribo! A shout out to him also. Hribo! Hribo! So. He is a Chaupati export to London. <laughs> And we'd like to thank you, Raja Mohan Prabhu. I sprung this on Prabhuji last minute. And uh, devotees always rise to the occasion. And uh, thank you so much for your kindness, for uh, yeah, asking such beautiful questions and facilitating us this evening. I think thank we should also give a Haribo to... Haribo! Thank you. All devotees' eagerness and... Our temple committee is, you know, facilitating this beautiful occasion to have. Because there's so much request that the congregation wanted to hear from you. And people on the social media, they were coming. And evening is the time for Bombay, South Bombay. It's the night time. It's a night club. A 9 p.m. club. <laughs> so, therefore, we facilitated this. 